Go. <laughs> Our first batch. I know. Yeah. Sample that. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, Gaz Williams here, coming from Toman Synth Reactor 2019. We've got a rather special little thing in store here. We're going to have a little round table discussion with some absolutely wonderful creators of sounds or creators of instruments, but certainly. But the point of this is to talk about the creation of sounds that other people are going to use, so essentially patch designs. And um, so what we'll do first is we'll just go around the, the table and just see who we've got. So, well, we'll start here. We've got Jackson. You come from Modal, and you've been doing patch designs for the, the, the current range of Modals. That's right, yeah. Yep. Um, Sculpt and the craft. Yep. Uh, but they're the first, the first commercial things that I've done. You know, right. since, um, since I've been making music, this is the first kind of... Okay. Foray into this sort of stuff. Yeah. So Jackson's, you're our kind of, uh, you know, because it's quite interesting because we've got some veterans at the table as well. So um, next we've got Rolf, and Rolf, Rolf, um, very involved in Waldorf's Quantum. Yes. Um, and many patches, patches that you've been making for that. Yeah, mostly I make patches for the instruments I develop, like like the Quantum or the the iPad Nave stuff. So. Uh, it's it's essential part for me of the development to do also patches mm. because then I, I know that the instrument or the feature is great or not. Mm. You know? Lovely. And uh, we have Mr. Rob Pappen of Rob Pappen yeah. <laughs> Software. Yes. And then, <laughs> so moving from hardware and into software. Oh, actually, this is funny. We've got our hardware couch and our software Well, he couch. segued starting with hardware before there was software. Ah. Somebody told me about this the other day. I had no idea if that yeah. was Yeah, my first m sound set was for the yeah. Microwave One. Ah, oh, 1990. Yeah, okay. Signature sound card. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Wow, fantastic. Yeah, wow. So, um, Rob, you, you make software now, and also you've written a book about. Oh yeah, that's, that's about uh, patch design. So we'll talk about that a, a, a little bit later. That's one. Yeah. And and we have John from Plugin Guru. And yes. Hello. Patch design is your stock and trade, isn't it? And yeah, I've been. I started at 1988 with Korg, with the the M1. Oh and really? T series, Wave Station, Wave Drums, you know, Oasis, Kronos. Wow, those all have my DNA in it. So you didn't do Universe on the M1, did you? No, a dear friend <laughs> of mine, Michele Pichuli, did. Oh really? Universe. Right. Wow. And uh, since 2009, I started a website, PluginGuru.com, where I sell patches for th over 30 synthesizers now. So. Wow. So. So b between the all, plenty of experience, and what I'm interested though to see is just you know your different approaches, and uh, and really I have a confession to make, and my confession is that I am terrible at making patches for other people to use. I've had numerous opportunities; people have asked me to do this, and uh, I've really struggled with it. And uh, so actually, I'll make this my first question, and it's um, and everybody will uh, will go around on it. I, I, um, when, when you approach, maybe if it's a new product or if it's a new library, what are your, what are your goals for what the sound essentially needs to do? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. What is the, what is the, so start with Jackson. What does, what do you feel that the sounds need to do? What do they need to have? I think it's, uh, it's kind of a, it's a broad question. So it's, it's a very broad um, question. But it's, it's, one of those <laughs> terrible, it's actually a terrible question. No, no, no it's a good question. It's a good, it's a good starting point. Uh, okay. it's, uh, it's very, very different if you're doing something personally to if you're doing something for you know, a product that's going to be released. Right. So if I had been um, working on patches for myself, it wouldn't uh, necessarily ever fly within a product. It might be like too weird or, or maybe too aggressive. Or you've, got to, you've got to be able to kind of, um, from my limited experience, you've got to be able to um, have something that is applicable for most people. You couldn't just populate something with, you know, entirely your taste on things. You have to be able to do the bread and butter that people expect. And I think that's the hard thing because naturally when you play with these things, you want to do what you want to do. And it's kind of uh, hard to have the discipline not to do that. Right. Interesting. Okay. So, Rolf, the same question. Yeah. I mean, I think it, when you do a new product, you want to have different kind of patches. So we have different kind of patch designers. And 
we know them, what are their flavors are. So some do bread and butter stuff, some do more the experimental stuff, and you know all who I'm talking about and more doing things. So I'm a little bit free then because we have to do my own stuff. Oh, know? nice. So uh, um, I'm not, I'm, I'm just an extra. And so I, I try to, to focus on what makes this instrument special about a feature to, to, to showcase this, to, to show the, also the, the, the range of the feature that the user then can use these things as a starting point to use to do their own stuff. Oh, excellent. Yeah, it's a good question. <laughs> I should, you should bring out a, a song bank. Terrible patches. Maybe there's a market for it. So <laughs> never think to 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 less of your own thing because uh, sound is a big uh, universe, yeah. and some sounds you think, oh, what's this? And people use it. So it's uh, music yeah. is changing. And uh, for instance, if you had a slight detuning of two oscillators, you had a kind of minimal lead sound, and suddenly there was a DJ who turned this knob a bit too much, and you got this EDM lead sound, yeah. which in the 80s, people would say in the studio, oh, come on, tune this right. right. But now this detune sound is a sound. So it's, it's a changing thing. And, um, yeah. So, so um, people, people can hear, they, they can accept sounds that they wouldn't have maybe accepted yeah. before. It's a, and distortion became a very uh, new thing in the, in the dance world. Of course, the, the Dutch guys are very big in the dance scene, hardcore dance, hardstyle, whatever. And they go off limits. They do things which I, for me, well, would be unlogic to do. But um, so it's a changing thing, and the demands are different. And there are all kind of people uh, as a audience, just like you said. Some like this, some like that. And uh, yeah. but it's a journey. It's a, it's a, it's will never get boring, in my opinion. So yeah. Um, and yeah, from from my brand perspective. We have uh, on board some very good sound designers like Jamal, who does very different stuff than I do. I do very often very classic stuff, which would be for hip hop, R and B, or for yeah. fusion music, classic synth sounds. I'm good in that kind of stuff, and other people do other stuff very well. So, um, yeah. and and um, but it's um, it's also very hard to predict. So you can make something, but something something takes off in right. a very different direction, right, yeah. and there's no control about it. It's the same what you do as the Waldorf brand. You make yeah. something, and something takes a different road, and you didn't expect it. Yeah. But that's the fun part. So, exactly. Um, yeah. So there's, you get a pitch yeah. from your for your own instrument. Yeah. And you think, how did he do it? Yeah. 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 Mm. Great. That's the magic. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's a broad question because yes. ideally, what you're asking about is how to learn to make patches other people will sit and play and be inspired by. Yeah, I guess. That's really yeah. what it comes down to. Yeah. And a lot of times when you're like on an album project, mm -hmm. you're making sounds that need to fit into a song and you're not thinking about anybody playing it, you just want it to fit into the song a certain way. Mm. And so that type of programming is different than somebody alone in a store in Texas mm -hmm. playing your sound mm -hmm. and knowing what to do with it. Mm. And so, you know, once, once you break it down to, okay, this needs to be for this instrument, I mean, spend time with the instrument, you'll learn its personality and what it's good at and what it's not so good at, and then listen to music. I listen to a lot of music. I need to always learn. I need to know how to make huge, serum badass, wick, wick bass sounds, just <laughs> like I can make a classic synth bass for the, the you know, funkadelic. Hey, you know? Funkadelic. I mean, you have to, it, it's, right. it's a never-ending learning process. And then there's other times where you just turn everything off, I did a library called Beautifully Broken, where I just turned everything off and I tried to make Omnisphere sound bad. Right. And by doing that, I made really cool groove things that are in a whole different flavor than I normally program from. Mm -hmm. Because I wasn't listening, I was like listening to like Boards of Canada that I listened to 10 years ago in the back of my head, but nothing new. And so there's just so many ways to approach programming. It just depends on oh. your target. Right, so, so what I'm gonna say now then is, is I, I'm a bass player and I like to play synth bass, so uh, creating a bass patch. Uh, what I would like to ask you is what is important in making a good bass patch? This is, um, yeah, this is an interesting one because it's either, it's, it's, 
bass is such a huge spectrum in terms of synthesis. Uh, is it something where you know you're going to be filtering quite low and you can add you know, a certain amount of harmonic content beforehand, or is it something that you want to be really brash anyway? I think you have to really tailor it to the style of, of music, and that's what's quite difficult, because I remember when I was younger, when I was still a kid learning this stuff, and there would be problem areas or, or you know, things that I would find more difficult. And I remember the period of time thinking, oh, I'm not that good at bass. And then I remember, you know, six months later, without really consciously spending any time uh, trying to solve it, because there's no like, there was no, you know, like the book that Rob has. This, there wasn't any resources like that then. Um, so you just have to learn those things. You just have to keep going and trying to find out how these things work. And then six months later, I remember the kind of epiphany of like, oh, actually, this is starting to become clear. So what, what, for instance, there regarding bass, what, what would be an epiphany? Um, just that it. It doesn't have to be complicated. I think the, the the biggest thing for me was thinking that bass patches were like some magic or mystery, and actually the the, the simplest things, uh, the, you know, the, the most effective things are actually the simplest ones. So having something with just a little bit of movement and a little bit of detune, and then maybe, you know, removing some of that top content as the sustain sort of portion comes in, is all you really need. You can go for something that's really um, brash and kind of. Um, aggressive, uh, but you know, more often than not, for bass, you want something that's quite subtle, maybe quite percussive as well. Mm -hmm. So it's you know, getting the right sort of envelope shapes, getting the right kind of um, just harmonic content as you know the, the sound shapes. Excellent. Yeah, but you know, you're not to know that when you start. You think everything has to be right. yeah. impressive. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Yeah, I think uh, bass sounds are one of the most difficult sounds to do because. Uh, I think the only more difficult sound is, is making a good kick drum. You can spend nice. years <laughs> to make a kick drum. And bass for the... I think one, one important aspect is the spectral content of the, of the bass sound. Because that's somehow in controllability. That means you don't know how the bass sound is used in, in whatever context. Is there a fat kick drum? If, or if the, bass, uh, if the bass sound is alone, do I need more harmonics? Or will the harmonics fight with other stuff? Mm -hmm. So one, as one aspect is to make one bass sound, but the other aspect is to have it somehow control, controllable, to okay. have a good uh, uh, um, um, filter curve. To, ha to have a good modulation going on, which you can easily then adapt to, to the context where you use it. I think that's the most important star uh, part for bass. Okay. Yeah. yeah your products <laughs> always have really a great selection of bass patches. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Subum paper and nose bass. Subum bass is, of course, a huge machine done in every... Uh, uh, Tim and Rob, they are big producers in America, mm -hmm. doing hip-hop, R&B, Subum bass all the time. Yeah. Uh, even it was originally designed as being an urban machine, but it landed in trance music, it landed in, in house, a lot of house producers. It's a very focused product. And uh, talking about a good bass sound, um, it's very easy for you, because I talk about it in the book. If you hit your note, how much strings are moving? Yeah, usually one. Yeah. So a good bass sound, can be one oscillator. Yeah. Because it has a simple reason if you use two oscillators and they are on the same octave, you get phase problems. Yeah. That's why you hear on Michael Jackson, his album, you hear the mini mode. There are always a the second oscillator is one octave higher. Yeah. So these are little things I teach to the, uh, in the book, tell people about making a bass. Think also to the acoustic world. So some people think, okay, I want to make a fat bass. This synthesizer has six oscillators. Boom, 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 boom. Put them on, then I get a fat bass. No, yeah. one oscillator can do the job. You get muddy soup. <laughs> yeah. So and and bass is. Um, I had it. I mean, the, you you should always be able to learn something because uh, we did an album with uh, all the band, and I was working with my my uh, fellow guy in uh, in the studio, and I had a nice bass from Southern Bass. And he said, put off the chorus. And I did put off the chorus, and it fitted nicer uh, in the music. And sometimes chorus can be nice, even on bass, mm -hmm. but sometimes so, you need to put off something, make yeah. it more simple, more focused. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, bass is difficult, but it shouldn't have, be this way. Because yeah. think acoustic, go back to your 
original bass, yeah. and uh, don't stack basses. That's very risk, uh, for, uh, a lot of risk, because in a band there is always one bass player. Mm -hmm. Because you have face problems could pop up if you have two bass players and they're nice yeah. tuned and they play the same note. Yeah. Where's my bass? Yeah, you have a face problem. Yeah. 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 So it's uh, it's complicated, yeah. but on the other hand, it's also easy. Yeah. Yeah. The big trick, in my opinion, is context. And so usually when I'm making patches, I have drum loops and grooves mm -hmm. immediately ready to call up and play. Ah. And then play the sound you're making to the. Does it fit mm -hmm. the groove that, if you're doing a drum and bass thing and it's a crazy drum groove, then you want crazy frequencies that are gonna get attention. So you want <laughs> But if you're trying to do a slow ballad, that <laughs> Luther Vandross is gonna be pissed off at you, right? <laughs> so you wouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. So you take the kind of context, the type of drum groove, where mm -hmm. this is gonna be used, and then you can dial the sounds in to that, how you're gonna use it, so. Drum groups. And the other thing is, because you're never sure how the mix is going to work, right, filter and uh, cutoff is usually I put to the mod wheel instead of modulation, so that you can just soup it a little bit mm. brighter if you need a little more harmonic content for the mix. Uh, uh, you know, every patch that I've ever made, the mod wheel is used usually to transform from one sound to another, so you can find somewhere in there mm. that would be the sound you want to yeah. use. Yeah. Oh, excellent. Something with that. Um that we're doing at the moment, which has been like the most fun because you have something that has like wavetables and oscillator modifiers, you can go from a really, really subtle sound to something really crazy at the yeah. other end of the mod wheel. Yeah. That's kind of like the most fun to do because yeah. you don't know how many people are going to instantly draw for that, but when yeah. they do, there's this little Easter egg for mm, them. Nice. Like, oh my God, there's, yeah. you know. Yeah. When, when Skrillex hit, I did a library called Toxic FM8, where yeah. FM8 yeah. starts with a sine wave. And on the mod wheel are five operators of FM synthesis ready to just rip your head off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so but all that stuff has to have that clean sort of like yeah, yeah. rent to it. So but starting it depends with the sign on the music is, also, yeah. It's yeah. like drum and bass is a very different bass than for instance uh, hip hop. Yeah. And for instance hardcore dance doesn't have a bass, only has a kick. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So yeah. yeah. It's, uh, it depends on the content. Yeah. yeah. A lot of modern songs don't really have bass lines either, they, they just have like sustain. Mm. Yeah, a lot of times it's a huge bass tone, just like mm -hmm. sub boom bass, mm -hmm. right. gets right. busy. Yeah. 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 Um, so, how important is stereo in your patch designs? And how dangerous is it? And how dangerous yeah. is it? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. This is a really interesting one for me because I think, personally, and you're probably, like, this would be quite polarizing, I think personally we're at a point where uh, phase issues in the low end are becoming less relevant because uh, people, well, it, initially that was because of uh, pressing to vinyl. It was something mm -hmm. to do with, you know, um, the way that you cut vinyl, it would make the needle pop out the groove and, mm -hmm. and it was like, we can't, we can't really justify yeah. letting people do this, so there's always the advice to yeah. reduce the mono. Mm -hmm. And, um, like, most of the information you'll find will mm -hmm. suggest making sure it yeah. is in mono. And I think that's, that's okay, maybe, but if you only sort of resign that to, like, 80 hertz and below, but actually the rest of the content, when you think about really aggressive basses that you get in you know, modern styles like dubstep or something like this, it is all about that width because it's essentially a lead sound. You know, it's, it's not just your bass, mm -hmm. it's your lead as well. So yeah. it is like the normal advice is to say, make yeah. sure it's mono, but actually yeah. I'm hearing more with like modern productions, uh, even with uh, non sort of aggressive types of basses, a lot of kind of width, which yeah. is kind of what makes them stand out in a mix. It's a bit of, um, I don't know if it's an okay thing to do or not, but you know, sometimes I'm okay just leaving it on and being wide and not worrying about it. Um, it's not like a hard and fast. Yeah, tools for it. Mm -hmm. we, we recently re um, released Master Magic, mm -hmm. and what it does, below a certain range, it makes mono. But if your ba ba bass is from the bass, very harmonic, full and stereo wide, it keeps it. Mm -hmm. But the rest, below a certain frequency it goes mono okay. and then you have a very tight bass and the rest is right. spread. They did that also already in the early age in an analog trick before cutting uh, the vinyl stuff because of the reason what you said, alright, it jumps out of the... Yeah. 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 Part of the reason I was asking is about stereo and, and not necessarily specifically to do with bass but just stereo in general because 
strangely, 2019, so many people listen to music in mono. Mm. So many devices, like uh, app, you know, Amazon Alexa oh, devices and yeah. Apple HomePods, and you know, yeah. and uh, you, know, yeah. you know, so so it's strange. So I was just thinking, if you, you know, is stereo because it, yeah. it's so seductive stereo. I mean, how about yeah. yourself, Rob, with stereo? Yeah, I mean, a, a, a good oh, sound oh. in stereo should also work in mono. Mm. Right. So, I mean, okay, if you do a lot of panning, and this is a auto panning, this is an essential part of your patch, okay, but it should still work somehow in a decent work mm. uh, in mono because of all the devices and because you do not know what the mixer will do. Mm. You know, I mean, you have your stereo, and if you just play your own sound, it, it sounds nice, but then it has to fit into a mix, and the mixer might d decide to do something else to place it somewhere in the sound stage. However, <laughs> some guy asked me for the Quantum, yeah. and I was in his studio, he's a film composer, and Rolf, let's do a quad version. Yeah, and Ooh. I was surrounded uh, by four speakers, cool. yeah, nice. cool. and there are not so many quad-based synthesizers, so he, mm. he, he got me hooked up. But these are edge cases, this is a really yeah. special case, okay. because from, from the quad he's doing 5.1, because it's easily to have the sub mm. right. and the front center, but, well, yeah. but keep, keep careful also with effects. It's the same question, similar yeah. question. It's yeah. nice to hear it in stereo with some effects, but it should also work in mono. Well, for, for I, I kind of picture stereo as like, who's going to be the star that should have the most attention to stereo imaging? And then don't let everything else try to fight with that. You know, Let it be like, who's in front of the stage and who is the supporting cast? And so it's, it's a lot easier to approach that way as long as you, you know, if you put stereo on everything, then it gets to where, you know, well, if you have a thing that's right in the middle, sometimes you can like just like a warm blanket, cover them up with all sorts of like beautiful lushness. But more often than not, you want something that's gonna like, you know, my favorite albums are ones where the sound comes out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. And it's so big in the space that and it's a different space than what was anything else in the mix. And so it just grabs your attention really quickly. And so. That's because of a priority to who gets this space versus that space. And sometimes just a reverb change will do that. You know, put a little percussion sound through a totally different reverb, and that will all of a sudden take the stereo space somewhere else. So, Yeah, in these days it can be easily overkill. It's very easy yeah. to kill. Yeah. I, I think you also need to think in contrast. So if you have a nice bad sound, which is stereo, put the bass mono without a chord. So then, because of the bass is mono, yeah. the rest looks more stereo. Uh, but I think the old guys who did, uh, sometimes I listen to Earth, Wind and Fire, and when I listen to this, it's amazing how the guys did this. Mm, yeah, it yeah. sounds so tremendous good, and, uh, yeah. and they have limited features than we have, and they did it. Yeah. So, uh, On the other hand, I think it had to do with the mixer. Oh, yeah. The that mixing, one. I mean, when you're in a computer, that's a whole other topic for mm. another day, but... Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you, you take a synth that's playing five parts, like Omnisphere, and if you take each of those parts to its own stereo channel, even in your DAW, the whole sound of the, uh, the, there's space and all sorts of things that you will notice in the sound versus everything fighting through a stereo channel. And so those old mixers, I mean, that's why people wanted them, because mm -hmm. they treated sound really nice. <laughs> yeah, and, and there's some basic things in making music. In, in a band you see one bass play, so let in your mix one instrument should do the bass. Watch out with the sequencers playing mm. too low in the low end because mm -hmm. everything get, gets rumbled and messed up. Mm. So High pass filters are your best friend. Yeah, the best yeah. friend to keep your mix open, definitely. Yeah. There's this concept of uh, our mind can only deal with seven things at, at one point in time. So if you can only, in your, in your direct frontal lobus, and it, yeah. Even and if that, and if, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But if another thing, Seven, if, if something else it. comes in, I don't know. If something else comes in, it knocks something else out. So it's a sort of way to suggest that music should only ever have seven elements ever happening simultaneously. Well, yes, Could or, be the case. Yeah. Right? But I mean, that's a, yeah. a potential total load of bollocks as well. It's just a theory. <laughs> well, no, no, no. That's uh, I know that also. So it's seven plus minus one. Mm -hmm. So some guys can do eight, maybe mm -hmm. nine, but that's over. And, but there is music, complex music, 
where you have maybe four or five things in the foreground and you have lots of stuff in the background yeah. perfectly organized which you do not hear consciously nice. but it's there and makes some mm. kind of complex thing, uh, orchestral mm -hmm. music for yeah. example, yeah? Mm -hmm. or big film scores yeah. often work that way. Sometimes you have, is, uh, some, I see people have a nice bad sound and then they play this as a chord, you know, hitting five notes, yeah. but with a pad sound, you take one there, one there, and one there, right. and you have a huge sound. It's like orchestral us. voicing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's how you treat an orchestra so, too. It's, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, so it's, it's a kind of magic. Music it remains a kind of magic. Yeah. Uh, watch Prince with Sign of the Times, how many yeah. instruments are playing yeah. Yeah. Very yeah. empty, yeah. Yeah. and it's totally great. So, yeah. less is more, also in music, still yeah. remains. Yeah. And, totally uh, and it's the same story with patches. Sometimes mm. less is more. Yeah. Yeah. So one thing I always love with synth sounds is that I'm really, I love kind of crazy psychedelic 70s kind of stuff. Like, uh, like, gee, I wonder why. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't sound like you dog, yeah. <laughs> so like a big, like big whooshes and swooshes, so non-tonal right, things, yeah. like, you know, like rises and, so um, how would you go about that kind of, what, what, would, what would be the key things that you would do to create you know, sort of like dramatic synth whooshes and swishes. I think those specific things, effects and, and, and sort of sound effects, rises, all that sort of stuff, is all super detail in the movement. Um, you said it doesn't really necessarily have to be like uh, so no pitch melodic, to it. but it, it yeah. can, no, it absolutely can be. I, I think a pitch is, is often really, really important. Yeah. Rises, if it was just white noise, you still have the same effect, but yeah. without a rising pitch, you don't have as much tension, you don't have as much release when it gets. Yeah. Um, you know when it disappears, so it's it's like you you have to first think about the movement, um, which is like how if you're doing a riser, if you're doing an effect, it's going to be very different. You want a really slow movement for a riser, but maybe you also want something else, which is modulating really really fast during that, and that's getting even faster as you progress. Yeah. Um, you know this sort of stuff is really like sounds fun. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's unique to what you're doing, but depending on what kind of sound you want to do. Mm -hmm. But that's where you get to play with kind of everything. Mm -hmm. Stereo width to the max, detune yeah. all the way on, you know, yeah. it doesn't matter because you're trying to make something that isn't, um, that isn't like your main harmonic content. It's not like your main um, melodies or chords or anything. It's actually, you know, it's something there as, as kind of a break from the bed, you know, just to, to transition you into another section. Mm -hmm. So given that it's not happening all the time, you can be really weird with it. You know, you can, you can kind of go a bit, <laughs> a bit the other way. Yeah. I think uh, there the, the comes an additional element into sound design here, which is not so much in, in normal lead sounds, which is the temporal development and temporal structures. Because if you have a bass sound, it has some kind of an attack, more soft, harder, it has some sustain, the decay, and, and done. But here you have sometimes a good textual sushi sound. Mm -hmm. It's a composition, it's a micro composition in itself. And giving that, for, if you do this for your own project, you can do whatever you want. It, the sound becomes already part of the composition. But if you want to give this to other people, it's difficult because you don't want to give them your little micro-compositions. You want to give them material textures with which other people want to do their own music. And, and, and for example, that, that's a thing, for my taste, uh, uh, Richard Devine is perfect in because it, they're little micro-compositions, but they are open enough, they're controllable and modifiable enough that other people can deform them uh, and make another temporal structure and use them as their own music. Mm. And that's a tricky part, I think. Mm. No, excellent. I just heard a patch of yours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 70s, right? <laughs> no, I, I, I was thinking about when I was young and did not play synthesizer but only listened to it. There's a kind of thing which is a magic which a listener has listening to music and once you start playing synthesizer yourself, you lose this magic. I can picture that I, I did listen to Mirage from Klaus Schulze. And it's so fantastic. And it, there's a kind of magic in what he does on that track. And afterwards, when I started to do uh, my own music with our own band, 
I noticed that a sound which was inside the music context, fantastic. And if you play, press solo, you thought, is this this great sound in yeah. this track? So there's a, there's a weird magic with music, which we never can catch. We make sounds, we make, but th there's a kind of part which yeah. we never will catch. Yeah, yeah. the so recipe. It's, it, yeah, it's magic. Yeah. Music is magic. Yeah. So, mm. yeah, and, and I'm making these things, yeah. We have quite some patches. Jamal, we, we uh, make some great patches. And he always has something going on. And sometimes they are not, not used for maybe musical because there's too much that the musical context is maybe too dominant inside of it. But they are enjoyable. And sometimes they really fit perfect. Yeah. So, but it, it's the content. Where yeah. do you use it? And, mm -hmm. But uh, but it's a part of it, it's magic. <laughs> which is, that's the fun part. Nice. In my opinion. Nice. Yeah. So 70s, that would be like air. Yeah, yeah. yeah that kind of a vibe. So that's yeah. just noise. Noise. Little resonance. In the quality of the filter, each of these instruments has a different characteristic to the filter, which is why there can be so many synthesizers because they yeah. all can do bongos. <laughs> Patch two. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, the, the other approach, take a bell sound. Mm -hmm. And just add a pitchy G and then an LFO that's going through that L, and all of a sudden you have a whole different type of a transition sound. So, but but what's great for those is usually those are to like segue into the next part of the song. So the idea is to find whether it's for an euphoria feeling, or it's supposed to be like letting you know that something different is coming on later on. I mean, there's different ways of dealing with transitions. So. Again, context. What context. you have to, what do you want this to do, or what do you hear it doing, and then listen to examples of that, and then you know kind of a direction to go in, and then you can personalize. I mean, I learned this a long time ago when we did the wave station, and we got sent these units, no instructions manuals, <laughs> right? And we all showed up in San Jose with our little banks of patches, and there are eight of us, and every one of them made the wave station sound totally different. That's mm. cool. Yeah. And I realized each person has a voice. You have a voice. You haven't found it yet, maybe. You haven't honed it. That just takes practice. That takes time, listening to yourself, aiming at things. And, and you know, no, it's like if you're trying to play the bass solo that, to your favorite song, you play it with your own interpretation. Mm -hmm. When you're trying to make a synthesizer sound, you're going to have your own interpretation of that synthesizer sound. Right. So yeah. it's just, you know. If, if you go, I, I failed, it's like, well, you didn't put enough money into the bank. So just need to spend some more time getting more into it. And things will start to click, you know? Well, it, so I generally need someone to bounce off. So actually, this could be a question we could ask. How do you, how do you know that something is kind of finished or that it's ready? What, what, what gives you your, your feeling to go, yeah. I mean, maybe, oh, actually, well, maybe that's experience, maybe that's it. Um, maybe it's about just, uh, well, actually, well, I'll tell you what, there is a question. We've got 10 minutes left, so the, the, the thing I really wanted to ask, I'm just going to cut to this point. Cut to the chase. Do you ever like to put little signet, have you got a personal signature, like some little thing that you like to put in in a certain patch? Uh, so if you're doing a patch library, are there certain like signature sounds that you want to put in? That's just a little sort of, uh, almost like a, like like signing your name in a patch. Is there? A, do you have anything like that? Like a little little just. So you made things for a general purpose, but you just put your own little signature sound in there. I think this is um, where modulation comes in the most. And when he's talking about mod wheel, after touch, expression things. Right. My, I think I've only done this probably for two products at this point, so it's very very slim on the ground. But my favourite thing is when you put you know, something hidden on something that not necessarily everybody has, so putting something on the expression yeah. so that, you know, the guys that do have that are going to find something deeper and that everybody at every level finds something in that patch that they can kind of twist and they can kind of get something else out of. Everybody's going to have uh, nice. MIDI keys, so, like, things on the mod wheel are always going to be there and they're going to be quite standard. It could just be vibrato and that's not something where you want to kind of sign your name, is it? But, like when you're thinking about aftertouch or expression or something like this, not everybody has access to those yeah. things and that's where you can get more interest. Put a little, little Easter eggs in. But I don't think, for me personally, just with the amount of time mm -hmm. I've been doing it, there's anything that I could say as a signature that I want to do, okay. or that I, that I do often. Consciously? No. Yeah. no. Right. I'm not thinking about putting a signature there. 
subconsciously, maybe some others may found that. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Not really, no. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's more the case that some people recognize my sounds, mm-hmm. but what I, another signature, it's not a signature, but what I like to do, for instance, if we bring out a new product and it's a synthesizer like we did now with Vecto, I always like to make some Jupiter H style of pet sounds. Uh, so that's because I like that. So, but that's so you will find that in Predator 2, you will find that in, in Facto, because I simply like to do these patches and want to try out how this will work out yeah. with the other waveforms. And so, but there's not, no, there's not really a, a, a signature, but there are some presets which people say, oh, hey, that's Rob, his pet, maybe, yeah. maybe, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I could guarantee you that if you gave me a bank with 10 patches from each of us, I could tell. Oh, yeah, maybe. Who made yeah, yeah. Every person has a signature. Mm-hmm. When you make a sound, I, I mean, I collaborate, I have libraries from people from Belgium, and that is a totally different thing than someone from Canada that loves pads and all these kind of warm sounds. And you really have a DNA to what you like to make mm-hmm. and the, type, the sounds that you make and the way you use filters. Everybody's different. It's a different religion that we all mm-hmm. will int- listen to whether we realize it or not. And so we all have our own signature. It's kind of voice, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's a voice. If, yeah. if, you're, if we were in a writer's guild, I love your style of writing. The way you do biographies is great. Mm-hmm. You know, everybody has a way of sharing with patches. And so, yeah. you know. We need to encourage him to make finishes. Yes. Uh, yeah, we need your voice in the mix, <laughs> man. <laughs> Brilliant, yeah. Uh, so, um, well, so we're just going to wrap up, but just uh, quickly, um, Rob, if we just say, uh, it's just, let's just plug this book, because it really... Well, it doesn't have to be plugged, because it's almost so loud. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's not a problem, but it will be having a reprint, and then it goes more into schools. It's, it's, not, it's, it's a basic training for anybody who is young, as a DJ, they start making music, and then they get their for a synthesizer in Ableton or whatever, yeah. and they say, oh my goodness, what an amount of dials. This one is a basic training. It's not about me in that term. It's only a training which I use, which is my own method. And what I tell them is that they need to understand the synthesizer according to these four elements. If you understand this, then you can work with a minimal, with a north lead, with a massive, you can work with a zomonosphere, you can sure. work with predator, yeah. Then you have a base. Of course, there are more little details each brand has, but that, these right. are details. It's like uh, learning to swim, and then you can expand on that. Mm-hmm. Because that is uh, the reason why I made it, because yeah, there, there are some books about synthesis, but the way I approach it is a bit different, because I'm, I make something which is very complex, very easy to understand. Because if you know from the base how a synthesizer works, it's very simple. Yeah. The things you can do with it are ridiculous, mm. right? endless. Yeah. But the base of it yeah. is very simple. It's like a cookbook. Yeah. You always have to have eggs. You always need yeah, flour. So, yeah. But I think that's yeah. the point is that you, you have, when you have a cookbook, you have a, an order, you have a kind of direction. If you did all those things backwards, you're not going to end up with the cake that you wanted because right. you, you did it in the wrong way. Right. So, for instance, what, what I tell, if I have a very organic examples of how to use waveforms. A simple example. So if, so, if somebody really would start with a saw waveform and trying to make a hip hop bass, mm-hmm. forget it. You start in the wrong place. Pick the sinus waveform. So mm-hmm. very basic yes. stuff. And if you want to make a trumpet sound, a kind of trumpet sound, don't use four oscillators because the trumpet has yes. one shell. Right. So you need or one a sine wave because the sine wave is not going to be the harmonics no, of a trumpet. No, no. So mm-hmm. you need a saw wave and you need one oscillator to make a trumpet. These mm-hmm. are very basic organic examples, but. Yeah. Synthesizers have also the, the natural rules in creating presets yeah. and, and, and pad sounds. You need violins, or many, many uh, people playing the violin, so you need a, a lot yeah. of oscillators to do a kind of pad sound or string sounds. Yeah. And one trick is, of course, the pulse width modulation to make a chorus type of sound. But yeah. so, um, so it's very basic learning, but from this base you can expand. It's, um, yeah, it's a, it's a basic book, essentially. It's a textbook. Mm-hmm. And uh, hopefully, uh, yeah, the, the point is now, it has four DVDs with 10 hours, but mm-hmm. nowadays nobody has a DVD anymore. <laughs> so in the new, in the new um, way, it will be a normal textbook, and people could go in the cloud 
and can watch the videos. But this is especially, of course, you, these guys here are all skilled, but these are for the young ones, right. for the new ones, right. so that they get yeah. into it and have fun, just yeah. like we have. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, well, I think we're just about to finish now, so I'd just like to thank you all for thank joining you. me. So, Jackson, just Rob, yeah. Rob, yeah. 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 and John. So, yeah, um, so, so goodbye from us here at Toman Synth Reactor 2019. Bye. <laughs> And uh, yeah, <laughs> he's he he gonna publish his first patch bank. That's right. <laughs> Next year, when we come back, you'll have a bank oh, this I year, hope right? So. Gareth's terrible <laughs> bank. <laughs> 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 Thanks. Okay. Oh, I love that.